This morning, would you please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, we're going to be looking at um, a rather large portion of Scripture, although the message in it is, is not difficult to understand. We've encountered it, I think, on a number of occasions. But certainly, we would all do with a bit of a reminder. Mark chapter 10, we're going to be looking at verses 35 through 45, and that's what I'd like to read to you now. Mark 10, beginning in verse 35. And James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to him, saying to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant that we may sit in your glory, one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. And calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Again, this is a, a very important lesson that we need to learn, especially if you hope to be someone great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, last week, as you remember, I hope, the Lord gave us a lesson on how we can overcome fear. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, knowing what was waiting for him there, and yet he was leading the disciples with such confidence that they were amazed. Where did Jesus get such courage? You think they'd know him better by this time. Well, we, we saw the way that Jesus found his courage. It was because he knew that at all times his life was in his Father's hands. He knew that he had a purpose for coming into the world and that he was doing what he was sent into the world to do. He knew that his Father would be with him through every step, that the Father would help him. And he also knew that there was a reward ahead of him. All of these things helped, of course, our Lord Jesus to do what he came into the world to do. And of course, the fact that he was son of God in human flesh also gave him greater encouragement. Now, the, you've got to realize that as the Lord calls us to do things that are very uncomfortable and are oftentimes fearful, I mean, even the disciples as they were following Jesus were afraid of what was ahead of them in Jerusalem, you need to realize, as I do as well, that the only way we're going to find the courage we need to do what the Lord calls us to do is exactly in the same path, by remembering these truths and applying them. It doesn't do us any good to know them if we can never make them connect with our lives. We actually need to apply these things. Remember that God is sovereign over all of your circumstances. And if you do his will and you fall into circumstances where uh, you might be threatened, that God has done that for some good purpose. He's going to work everything together for good. Remember that God has a good purpose for your life. He puts you in this world for a reason, and he intends to fulfill that purpose, whatever it may be. And he has the right to tell you what he wants you to do. That should give you confidence. That should give you courage. And the fact that he's not going to leave you on your own, he doesn't tell you to do things beyond your ability and then just say, do it in your own strength, but he's going to be with you. 
to help you do everything that he calls you to do. And that he's going to reward you for the things that you do for him. Remember that you only have so much time in life. You only have so much of everything of what you have. It's all limited. But everything that you give to the Lord, everything you give to him in his service, everything you sacrifice for him is like investing in your eventual retirement from this world in heaven. Those are the only things you're going to have that will last, that will, you'll be able to enjoy throughout the rest of time. But everything you do for yourselves in this world is, of course, going to be loss. Reward is a very important motive. Now, this morning, we're going to see how you can increase that reward from this particular passage, because being great in the kingdom of heaven is a reward. Now, two weeks ago, we also saw a lesson that Jesus gave his disciples in humility. Remember, the rich young ruler wasn't able to give up his possessions in order to follow Jesus, but the disciples could, and they actually did. Because of this, Jesus said their reward would be great in heaven. But to keep them from becoming proud of that fact, Jesus followed up with the parable of the vineyard. And he wanted them to know that even though they could expect a greater reward, they would also, because of their position, have to endure more difficulty, the heat of the day, more difficult circumstances, and that they, in essence, would become the servants of those who would follow after them. Yes, they would break ground. Yes, they would lay the foundation. Yes, it would be hard for them. And in doing so, they would actually be serving other people. But that was meant, of course, to humble them because Jesus had told them, again, their reward would be great so that he wanted them to remain humble servants. He gave them this reminder that in doing these things, they were actually just serving other people. Now, this morning, we're going to consider another lesson in humility and service, which is going to lead to a greater reward if you are willing to see these things and apply them to your lives. Now, the next thing we see, as we've just read in our text, James and John, seeking honor for themselves, but they're seeking it in the wrong way. So Jesus teaches them the right way to do it. Now, this morning, we're looking at how you can be great in God's kingdom. And the simple answer is this, become the servant of all. If you want to be the greatest, you have to become the last, the slave of everyone. So we're going to want to consider what that means, and then we're going to want to apply it. Again, it's not going to do us any good unless we actually apply it to our lives. So the first point is this. You can only be great in God's kingdom by becoming the servant of all. Now, first we see, the first thing we see actually is James and John's request. They said to Jesus, Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, that's, that's quite a broad request, isn't it? So Jesus, looking at them, says, well, before I can agree to this, I need to know what it is you want. And I think, of course... Be wise for us, if you're ever going to agree to something, make sure you know what it is before you agree to do it. Jesus is our example here, too. They said, Jesus, in your kingdom, when you come into your glory, let one of us sit on your right hand and the other on the left. In other words, he, they are saying, grant us the places of greatest honor in your kingdom. Now, Jesus had just told them, although... Mark didn't include this, but Matthew does. And I believe we talked about that when we covered that text. That in, in the renewal, when Jesus would sit upon his glorious throne, they too would sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, they knew that. They knew that's what Jesus had promised. They just wanted the best thrones in that kingdom out of all the 12. They wanted the ones closest to Jesus. Well, the Lord says, ask and you shall receive. But we also need to realize that you need to be careful what you ask for. I think what they were asking for was not appropriate. Now, second, we see Jesus' answer to their request. First of all, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? 
Are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Now we need to stop right here and notice one thing because Jesus is actually telling us here the key behind his exaltation. You want to be great? Are you able to go through what I am about to go through? Why did Jesus say that in response to their request except that this is the way to greatness? Notice that honor in God's kingdom is based on two things. It's based on servanthood, because that's what Jesus was doing. But it's also based upon suffering for doing what is right or for rendering that service to the Lord. Now, Jesus was about to go or undergo the greatest suffering that anyone had ever undergone. He would drink the cup that his father would give to him. He was going to be baptized, as it were, with the Lord's wrath. And as a result, he would receive the greater honor. The more you serve and the more you suffer for your service, the greater your reward will be. Now, James and John, of course, still wanted those two seats, so they told Jesus, we are able to go through what you are going to go through. Well, Jesus replied to them, you will drink my cup. You will be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to undergo. Now, I think what Jesus meant by that was not exactly what I'm going to go through, but something like what I'm going to go through, and, and certainly it's true when you look at what happened to the disciples. All who live godly will suffer persecution. Jesus said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Jesus told them the time is going to be coming, uh, and really now is, when those who kill you will think that they are offering service to God. Yes, James and John were going to go through suffering for their service, but not exactly like Jesus. I mean, they weren't going to suffer God's wrath. They weren't going to suffer the degree that Jesus was, nor would they ever be able to serve to his degree. And for that reason, those places of honor may not necessarily be theirs. Now, some have conjectured that what Jesus was saying here when he says that this, these places of honor, to sit on my right hand and my left, this is not mine to give. Some believe he meant just right now it's not mine to give. It's going to be in the future. It's not something that I'm going to give just because you ask me for it. At least we know that that much is true. And it could also be true that it was simply the Father who was the one who was going to uh, actually give those places of honor. Jesus didn't say that it wouldn't be theirs, but he did say that it's not mine to give. He says it was for those for whom it had been prepared. Now, God has a plan. His plan is absolutely sovereign over everything. His plan includes what his people are actually going to do, what kind of service his people are actually going to be called to, and, and even the amount of service they're, they're actually going to give to him, and the suffering that they will go through because of their service. The one who serves and suffers the most will be the one who is honored the most. The Father had already ordained who that was going to be. He already had those places picked out. Now, Jesus, again, didn't say it wasn't theirs, but he just simply said, it's not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it had been prepared. And the way that a person gets to those seats, or any seat of honor in the kingdom of heaven, by the way, there's not just two seats. You know, there are places of honor in the kingdom of heaven. There are many places at the table. Uh, for all of God's children, of course, everyone who trusts in Jesus is going to be there. But there are going to be some more honored than others. And their honor is going to depend on how much they serve the Lord and how much they suffered for that service. Now, thirdly, we see the others become angry. When it says they were indignant, that means that they were upset. They were angry. They were, um, uh, well, there's different slang ways of putting that, but they were, they were angry. And the reason was because they wanted the same thing that James and John wanted. They wanted those places of honor, but they were upset because James and John beat them to the punch. Now, you know how that works. Our flesh naturally, and I mean flesh by that, I mean our sin nature, naturally wants the best 
for itself. We want the better things for ourselves. And we become jealous when we see somebody else seeking that place for themselves. I thought of a, a uh, you know, the fact that, um, you know, oftentimes we don't see it in ourselves as easily as we see it in other people. But I think one way in which most of us can see it is what happens on the road every, every day when you're traveling back and forth <laughs> on the Autobahn, as it were. It's a racetrack out there for most people. I mean, next time somebody pulls in front of you, I mean, somebody's coming up alongside and there's plenty of room behind you, but they have to get in front of you and pull over because you're in their way and they want to get ahead of you. Uh, just think about the fact of how you feel when that takes place. Nobody wants second place. Nobody wants to fall in behind. Everybody wants to be in front. And that's because there is this principle at work within the people of the world, but still in our hearts. We want to be in front. We want the best place for ourselves. I used to think as uh, my dad used to take us to the, the desert and the mountains years ago and on the way back we'd always hit a bunch of traffic and at the traffic light there'd always be the car in the front and we'd be in the back and I thought how nice it would be to be in front. You know, it's, just, it's always thinking, you know, I want to be in front. I want to be out ahead. I want the recognition. I want the glory. I want the honor. Sadly, the same thing takes place within the church. And because that's happening, there's a lot of people vying for position, but very little service. It's actually taking place in the church because the people of God don't want to serve. Now, Jesus saw this as an opportunity to teach them, as what I've already told you, perhaps the most important lesson having to do with honor in the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to gain that honor by asking the Lord to honor you, by seeking for that honor. You know, Lord, please bestow upon me the greatest honor. I mean, that's obviously that, uh, that kind of thinking is prideful and sinful. Jesus says the only way you're going to reach the place of honor is by seeking to humble yourself, is by seeking the lowest place, is by seeking to become the servant and the slave of everyone else. That actually goes against, you know, pretty much every natural inclination that we have within us. Uh, again, wanting to be first to become the last of all. Now, Jesus, of course, had wonderful examples around him to point out what should not be done. And he points out one of the best current examples of what not to do. Don't do as the nations do. Don't do what those who do not know God or keep his ways would do. He points to the Gentiles. The Gentiles, when they have authority, they use it to lord it over those under their authority. And then they have greater men over them who exercise authority over them. Jesus says, don't be like that. Now, is it wrong to have authority? Is it wrong to use authority? Well, of course not, because the Lord is the one who's actually appointed or ordained authority in his creation. But it is wrong to use authority in the wrong way. Don't use it to lord it over others like the Gentiles, forcing them to do your will to make you look good so that you can advance. The right use of authority is to use it to serve those who are under you for their good, that they might be better, that they might advance. I mean, of course, Jesus, again, being our greatest example, we're going to look at that in just a moment. Jesus says, this isn't how it is with you. This is not the way the kingdom of heaven is. Whoever would be greatest among you must be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first of all must become the slave of all. This is just the opposite of what James and John were actually asking. They shouldn't have been saying, Jesus, give us these seats of honor. But they should have said, Jesus, help us to be a slave or a servant to everyone. Jesus is telling us again that in his kingdom, it's those who serve others, those who take the greatest pains and endure the greatest hardships to bring glory to God and to do good to the souls of others. These are the ones who will be first in the kingdom of heaven, not those who seek glory and honor for themselves in the kingdom of heaven. Now, finally, Jesus rounds off his teaching with a good example and points to himself. 
he was the one who was going to receive the greatest position of honor and authority in the kingdom of heaven, exalted above every name that is named. Everyone would bow the knee to him. And why is that? Because he took the role of a servant. Being the Lord, he became the servant. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many or to suffer. And just think about the life of Jesus Christ. I thought about this as I was thinking. He didn't come to be served. And when you look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels, you really don't see Jesus being served, do you? At least not very much. There were those ladies who accompanied him, those women that Luke talks about. The other Gospel writers seem to miss it altogether. But those ladies of some uh, substance, of some wealth, who contributed out of their personal wealth, to his needs and the needs of the disciples. So in that sense, they ministered to him. Uh, he did allow Martha to prepare a meal for him, and I'm sure that there were others who did so. A woman on one occasion came in and anointed his feet with her tears, but that was to prepare him for burial. His disciples brought him a donkey to ride, so he could ride into Jerusalem, and somebody uh, took a sponge full of vinegar and put it up to his mouth while he was on the cross to give him a drink while he was dying. Now, Jesus wasn't very often served, was he? He didn't come to be served, but to serve. And his whole life was one of service. I mean, taking care of the needs of his disciples, teaching them, keeping them out of trouble, even protecting them when their lives were in danger. He didn't come to be served, but to serve, to lay down his life for his friends and to give his life as a ransom for many. So his whole life was that of service, of suffering for that service. I mean, really, his, the whole nation of Israel turned against him. Those who were his own, he came to them, and they didn't receive him. They rejected him. They called out for his blood. And because of his service and because of his suffering, for that reason, he would be given the place of greatest honor and authority in the kingdom of heaven. The one who serves and suffers most will receive the greatest honor. So if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you must become the servant of all. Now, let's just apply this for a moment. Obviously, I, I, I think, if, if I understand my own heart, and I, I, I think I'm no different than anyone else, we all share the same nature, we all want the same things. I think all of us want a degree of honor in the kingdom of heaven. I think we would enjoy that. If you want that, obviously, you're not going to find it in the path of seeking honor for yourself. You're only going to find it in serving the Lord and serving other people and suffering for that service. The one who serves and suffers the most will receive the greatest honor. And I was thinking about how different this, this, this really is from the attitude of most believers today who often go from church to church looking for the congregation that is best going to serve them, that is best going to meet their needs. Now, some of that may be legitimate. You certainly want a church where the truth is taught. But many look for other things that they shouldn't be looking for. Is this church going to serve me? Does this church have the programs that my children want? Do they have the youth group that my children want? Is the worship, the kind of music, the kind of music that we want? Is the kind of preaching that's going on here, the kind of sermons they're preaching, the kind that make me feel good about myself? You know, there's that uh, parody of, of this church growth movement on, uh, I think it's on YouTube, called Me Church. If you haven't seen that, you should look at it because that is the direction the churches are going. It um, takes it to the extreme, but I'm wondering if churches like that don't exist. We shouldn't obviously be looking for places to serve us. That's not what Jesus is telling us to do, but rather looking for a place where we can actually serve. Now, how are we doing in this, in this area? You know, are we... That kind of person, I don't think we have folks like that around here, but still, we have to recognize Jesus calls us to be servants. And are we serving to the degree that the Lord would have us to serve? Are we really seeking for that honor in his kingdom? Here's a few questions to think about. When there is a need, do we 
reach out to meet that need or do we wait to see if somebody else is going to meet it first rather than being the first to step up to do that work? Do we find within ourselves a desire to be served rather than to serve? Now, let me stop here for a minute and just say something that I'm, I'm sure that we all understand. There are times when we do need to be served. There are times when we are weak and we're tired or perhaps we're beat up by Satan. We're going through difficult times and we need that refreshing fellowship of the people of God. There are times when we need that. But we, we got to remember too though that we need to be careful that we don't excuse ourselves on account of that from working in the vineyard and avoiding service altogether when we are able to work and we don't. You do realize uh, the kingdom of heaven works in such a way that if you're the, on the receiving end of service all the time, you're going to find yourself a spiritual pygmy. You're going to be stunted. But if you are the one who's on the giving end, remember what our Lord Jesus says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Is that true? If you've ever given, and I think you all have, you know it's true. It's always better to be on the giving end, to be on the serving end, than to be on the receiving end. And why is that? Because while you're receiving from others who are serving in the name of the Lord, they're being blessed by God and they're growing. And you, well, I mean, if, if you need that service, that's fine. But if you don't, and you're just not willing to do the work, then you're sinning. And by doing that, you're grieving the spirit and your flesh is getting stronger and so forth. Now, I'm talking about, again, if you're in a situation where you don't need that service, but you're constantly receiving service and letting other people serve you. But if you're on the other end of giving, the Lord is, is ministering to you. The Lord is blessing you. You're actually standing in, the, in the, the place where Jesus would have you to stand. You're doing what the spirit of God would have you to do. By doing that, you're, you're actually drawing strength from the Lord as well as not strengthening your flesh and not grieving the spirit so that you will have the strength to do what the Lord calls you to do. We're going to look at that actually a little bit more this evening as we consider how it is that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in obedience in every area and how as we do that, we grow stronger versus how if we give in to sin, we grow weaker as we continue to try to understand how to put to death our sins and how to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, again, let's get back to the basic question. Do you want honor in the kingdom of heaven? Do you want recognition from the Lord throughout all eternity? Not only before him, but also through the, you know, in the eyes of the saints. Do you want a greater reward in heaven than you can expect to receive now, certainly it's going to be wonderful just to be in the kingdom of heaven and not to have to, you know, to suffer hell forever for your sins because that is what we really deserve, but for the grace of God. I mean, Jesus is giving to us already far more than we deserve, but do you realize that he is willing to give you even more if you're willing to honor him? The Lord says he will honor you. We might look at it in this way. The more you drink from the Lord's cup, the more you're baptized with his baptism. When he, he told um, James and John that that's what they're going to do, he didn't mean just them, but everyone who would be his disciple, everyone who would follow him. The more you're willing to drink this cup, the more you're, under, you're willing to undergo this baptism, the more you're going to be honored by the Lord. Now, this comes only through service. That's the only way it comes. And that, not just for your brothers and sisters, for the Lord's sake, although that is very important as we've been looking at fellowship, but also by serving potential brothers and sisters, by serving your neighbor, by bringing the gospel to them. Remember what the second greatest commandment is. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's not talking about just your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's talking about everyone who is near you. And there are people around you who need your service. Those the Lord will honor the most are those who will suffer. But you know what? The kind of suffering that he's talking about here is, 
in a certain degree, it's, it's hardship. And certainly when you reach out to minister to other people, you can go through hardship. And there's, there is a kind of safe ministry that you can do that people will generally accept, even the people of the world. And I don't think that that's what he was talking about so much when he said to James and John, you're going to go through this baptism, you're going to drink of this cup. It's not because they would necessarily clothe the naked. Usually people who get clothing and good things or when you give food to the hungry or when you go down to Tijuana and you build houses for people or whatever it may be, those people don't get upset that you did that, do they? I mean, they don't get angry at you. You don't suffer that much because you've done that. I mean, it makes you a little bit tired, put yourself out a little bit and so forth. People of the world will applaud you for that kind of work. I, I don't think that's the reward he's referring to here, the kind of service or how you receive the greatest rewards, although we do need to be doing those things. But I think what Jesus has in mind here is suffering for the same reasons that Jesus suffered. Jesus didn't suffer because he fed the 5,000. He didn't suffer because he may have met other needs among the people. He suffered because he spoke the truth to others. He was willing to warn them of their danger, of God's judgment for their sins, and of their absolute need for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you want to talk about what is going to bring per persecution. That is what's going to bring it. I mean, Jesus preached to what we would, would have thought would be the choir. He preached to his own people, the old covenant people of God, the Old Testament church. These were the people of God. He brought his truth to them, and they hated him for it. And he suffered for it. I mean, he really didn't even preach that much to the Gentiles. He preached mainly to the church, and those are the ones who persecuted him. That is the kind of service that is going to bring persecution. Now, this is a greater service to the Lord than basically anything else you can do. And when you do this, you open yourselves up to the possibility of suffering. So instead of really looking at that, and this is, I think, the reason why we often recoil at the idea of going out to other people and serving them in this way is because we're afraid that we're going to suffer. But instead of looking at that as a reason to avoid serving the Lord in this way, we should look at it instead the way Jesus looked at it, the way that Paul looked at it, the way the martyrs looked at it, as an opportunity to gain honor. I mean, think about Paul and when he went through the sufferings that he went through, he basically gloried in the fact that he did suffer for Jesus Christ. He says in Galatians 6, 17, from now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus Christ. Now, he actually gloried in the fact that his body was scarred because he had suffered so much in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says on another occasion when he talks about all the different things he was going through, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. I think sometimes we think the Christian life, again, is a life of ease, and that there's really not that much to suffer, not that much to do, but if we were doing what the Lord actually called us to do, there would be a great deal of service to be done. There is, I mean, there's a world to be evangelized. But we would also be suffering for it, and we know that. And that's one of the reasons why we're unwilling actually to step out and do what the Lord calls us to do. But look at the examples we have in Scripture. Look at the example of Paul that I just read. Didn't sound to me like he was living a very easy life, but this was the life he chose. This was something he was willing to do, to serve the Lord in this way and to suffer in this way so that he might receive the glory and the honor that the Lord would give to him on that final day. Jesus says, how can you believe who seek honor from one another, but don't seek the honor that comes from God? Don't we often find ourselves in that very position? 
We want people to honor us rather than the Lord, which is why we don't suffer that much because we're not willing to serve that much. You realize that there were those in the early church when they, they, they understood this, they believed that it was true, and they were willing to profess Jesus Christ even though if they got caught for doing it, they would be thrown to the lions in the Colosseum and be torn limb from limb, literally be eaten alive, and they were willing to do that because they knew if they did, there would be greater honor, a better resurrection. I don't know if you've seen the Tyndale movie. Uh, he was willing to go, and his friend, uh, who uh, sort of almost turned himself in, I wasn't quite sure exactly why he did that, but uh, maybe it was because he thought that Henry was going to behave differently than he was. But Tyndale says, why are you going up to, to do that? Why are you turning yourself in? He says, I'm looking for a better resurrection. He was... When he turned himself in, he basically was put on trial and burned to the stake. Burned to the stake. I can't imagine, except maybe by eating, being eaten alive by wild beasts or being drawn and quartered, something that, you know, maybe that would be my, <laughs> my last choice, would be being burned to the stake. And yet they were, they were willing to do that because they believed if they did it for the honor of Christ, the Lord would more greatly reward them. They gave their lives up for this honor, and yet we find ourselves being afraid even to be spoken you know, harshly to by other people for standing up for the truth. Now, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you have to achieve it in this life. I mean, you only get one, and you only have so much time, and it's right here, it's right now, it's in this culture. You have to achieve it here. You have to be willing to serve the Lord here, and you have to be willing to serve everyone, and you have to be willing to suffer for it if that's what the Lord should will. The more you serve and the more you suffer, the more you're going to be honored in God's kingdom. Now, I don't think we should you know, run out and, and invite suffering, but we, I, I don't think we're going to have to do that because if we actually do what the Lord calls us to do, that in and of itself is going to invite suffering because Satan hates it, the world hates it, and they're going to persecute you for it. But the more you give yourself to it, the more you're willing to undergo, the more honor you will receive from the Lord Jesus Christ on that day which is coming, and you will have it for all eternity. So may the Lord give us that grace to seek more of that kind of honor by taking that path giving our lives to do the will of God and by being willing to suffer for his glory. Again, look at the table. This is what Jesus Christ was willing to do in order to receive the glory and honor that he was to receive from his Father. This is what he was willing to do for you. And Jesus says, I will give you honor, I will give you glory if you are willing to do that for me. Let's think about that as we bow for a moment of prayer and as we also prepare to come to the table. And let's pray that God would give us the grace to be willing to do what we, we know clearly is his will. We need his grace and strength to do it. But again, he can give us that courage. If we will simply remember the things that we've already seen, we'll have that courage to be able to face it, especially if you can see the reward, the honor that is ahead for everyone who actually will. Let's bow for a moment of prayer.